Well, well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Good stuff. All right. Well, welcome to Versailles Baptist Church. We are glad you're here. How about we stand and greet one another? Give somebody a hug or a high five. Tell them that you're glad they're here. All right, well, while, as you are being seated, we hope that uh, your week was great. We know that uh, there are a lot of places that you could be this morning, but that you choose to come and worship here uh, excites us. Um, I'd like to turn your attention to, uh, your, to kind of the pew rack in front of you. If this is your first time here, or if you just have never filled out one of these, this is our guest info card. We would, we would be honored for you to fill this out. This just lets us know a little bit more about you, how we can pray for you, all of that good stuff. So if you wouldn't mind tossing that in the offering plate as it goes by, and that'll be your offering to us. Also on the back is a place, um, if you'd like us to be praying about something, this is a church that prays, amen? I mean, this is a church that believes in the power of that. And so if you'd like for us to lift you up, uh, please uh, mark that on the back and pop that in the offering plate as well. Well, this week was Vacation Bible School. Pretty exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, who was a part of Vacation Bible School? Yes? Six of you. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was an absolutely fantastic week where we saw God move in big ways. Um, our biggest night, I, I think we had 140 uh, children uh, who were a part of that night. Um, and it was just great. We had, uh, what, over 60 or 70 volunteers uh, I mean, it was just it was just a really really great week, and so I want to say thank you, church, for loving children. I want to say thank you for investing. I want to say thank you for serving, and even if you didn't serve, thank you for praying and thinking about us. It is one of the biggest outreaches our church does every year, and so this year our theme it was called Colossal Coaster, and uh, it was fun. What we did is we uh, tried to help students through the Word of God know that um, we should face our fears and trust Him. And especially in doing that, our fear and our trust, um, well, our fear is conquered and our trust is secure when they know Jesus. And so we, we preached Jesus this week, and so it was absolutely exciting. We have a short uh, video to kind of give you some of the highlights of Vacation Bible School. So check this out. Derek, you can go ahead and play that.
standing as we uh, sing God Bless America.
in the 10th chapter of the book of Ezra. Ezra is confronted with his nation who have deeply departed from what God has told them to do. And Ezra's response in chapter 10 is by proclaiming, in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. And Ezra begins to mourn and fast and pray. And a large assembly of Israelites are drawn to Ezra as he is praying. And a revival sweeps across his land. I encourage us in this week of July 4th that we be reminded, as Ezra was, that in spite of deep and difficult times, there is still hope for our nation. And that our response as Christians is to seek our Heavenly Father to bring about change. Let's do that right now, shall we? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the founder of all nations. We recall how you have blessed us by giving liberty and freedom of worship. Lord, we remember how you built this nation based upon the principles of your holy word. But Lord, we confess Lord, we confess that there are ways that we have turned from your laws and decrees. We confess we need you now, Holy Father. Father God, we pray not just for stricter laws, but we pray for circumcised hearts. That the hearts of people would be so gripped by you that they would not desire to, to participate in evil or wicked deeds. Lord, we ask you to draw our nation closer to you. Father, we pray for our president, our senators, our congressmen and women, our governor, our state elected officials, that you would prompt them not just to do what is popular, but to do what is righteous. Father God, we recognize that drawing our nation closer to you begins with us. So, Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit among us, your people, to draw us closer to you. And, Lord, give us opportunities to have a godly voice to be heard and heeded. Father, open our eyes so that we may see the error of our ways. And, Father, we pray that you would turn our hearts to you in the hearts of every person in this great land to you. Finally, Lord, we pray for the churches in America that our focus will be on exalting the Lord, evangelizing the lost, and edifying the saved. And we wait eagerly for your return until one day you, you begin a more perfect, wonderful kingdom led by by you. So Father, we lift up our nation, we lift up our city, we lift up our churches to you right now and ask you, our Holy Heavenly Father, to be our guide, our conscience, and to draw us forever close to you, our Father. In the name of Christ that we pray. Let's stand again as we continue worshiping this morning. We're singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
have your Bibles, turn with me to the fourth chapter of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. We want to read verses 10 through 13 this morning. We celebrate and pray for our nation as we give thanks for God and his faithfulness to us. Trust we can also hear God speak to us related to the issue of contentment, how to find joy through the experience of contentment in our lives. Philippians chapter 4, reading verses 10 through 13 together. Reverence for God's word, one more time, let me ask you to stand and remain standing. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me, Indeed, you have been concerned, but you, you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Sing together this great hymn of faith and declaration. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, wonderful country and all the freedoms that we have and uh, sometimes that we may take advantage of all that freedom that we have, and, uh, but uh, we are so thankful, so thankful that we have the uh, opportunities to be here and worship you and um, not being, um, doing it without having to worry about being um, looked at or disrespected and, and put down, God. And, um, it's, it's a blessing to... Uh, have such a, a wonderful and uh, glorious country, God, and be with our military, those that continue to fight for us and, um, and that give their lives every day to um, protect us, God, and also uh, we want to uh, pray for those who are missionaries that are out in the fields that are protecting
protecting us and, and doing your work, God, and uh, just spreading your word. And especially we want to lift up uh, Sarah England, who is uh, on her way to Africa as we speak, and just give her uh, give her the strength and protection that she needs to uh, to do your will. God, uh, be with uh, be with this offering and bless it, and get uh, for the uh, glad and eat and those that will give, uh, and uh, also be with John as he. Uh, gives your word, God. And, uh, we love you, and it's all that you do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. together now hymn 512 Jesus is all the world to me
This morning we want to look at one of the most familiar verses in all of Philippians, perhaps one of the most familiar in all of the scriptures. A verse that at first glance to the critical thinker might seem a gross exaggeration or, or just pure a foolishness. But a verse that for many who have been followers of Christ for years has become the source of hope and strength in the midst of many dark and difficult hours. Oliver Cromwell once said that it saved his life because it was the one beam in a dark place of utter despondency and misery which followed the death of his son. In that hour of grief, in that hour of pain, he leaned heavily upon those words, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of us have probably used that in a little bit different way. Students, how many of you have ever gone into a test? You didn't quite study enough, but you bowed your head and said, I can do all things through Christ. Well, sometimes that doesn't work, does it? And sometimes we pray that prayer casually in the face of all of those kinds of situations. But it can also be that lifeline. It can also be that source of hope and encouragement in the difficult, demanding hours of life. Like all scripture, a verse needs to be understood in its context. You can't cut a verse out of scripture and, and just understand it. You need to understand the context of that verse. When you understand the context, you understand that Paul is not claiming to be a wonder worker. He's not claiming to be some spiritual superman. It's obvious that there were things he could not do. There were obvious that the circumstances that he could not change. There were even prayers that he offered to the Father that God did not answer as he thought he should. Remember the thorn in the flesh? God, take this away from me. And the answer comes, my grace is sufficient, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you in the midst of that experience. Many things did not go as Paul would have desired. But hear the claim. I can face any situation. I can face any demand. I can deal with any difficulty that life brings my way through Christ who gives me strength. What an incredible, incredible claim. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Or verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. Look at those contrasts. Look at those contrasts. I can live in need. I can live in abundance. I can be hungry or I can be full. I can have little, or I can have much. Three sharp contrasts that help us understand that the Christian faith is not just for those who are down and out, nor is the Christian faith for those who have plenty. Whether our hope in Christ is sufficient for whatever circumstance, whatever situation comes to us through life. Paul had understood that reality. He understood that Jesus gave him strength to continue his mission, to continue his purpose, to fulfill his passion for life. And the circumstances of life, yeah, he could deal with those. He could deal with those through the power of the resurrected Christ who lived within him. Let's look at the context. Let's see if we can understand this passage of Scripture a little bit more completely. Verse 10. Paul turns in this portion of his letter to the Philippians to this personal word. You remember he had been given a gift. Epaphroditus had brought a financial gift to Paul from the Philippians. So now Paul turns to thank them for that gift. He says in verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul says, I want to thank you for that gift. I want to thank you for that gift you've given. And, and I realize that, that you've always been concerned, but I thank you now that you've, you've had that concern blossom as you've been able to express that gift. Paul seems to be really careful here. 
He's trying to say, there was a time you could not express your concern for me. There was a time when, because I was inaccessible, or maybe because of your own poverty, you weren't able to do anything. You weren't able to give. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 8? Paul refers to a group of Macedonian churches. Flip over to your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is taking up a collection for the impoverished people in Jerusalem. He's writing the Corinthians to encourage them to be a part of that giving, part of that giving. And in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians, Paul describes those churches in this way. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overwhelming joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. How many people have you ever known who came and said, I want to be a part of that offering. Let's take up an offering. I remember some folks like that. I remember some folks like that. They hear a need, they see an opportunity, and they say, let's take up an offering, let's do something. Paul says these Macedonian churches, in severe trial, in their poverty, jumped at the chance of giving to the Jerusalem Christians who were in need. The Philippian church was one of those. In their need, in their poverty, they gave what they could and even beyond generously to meet that need. They prayed for that privilege. Prayed for that privilege. But Paul is also wanting to be careful in thanking the, the people for their gift that he's not implying, and I look forward to your next check. You know, you were already, you were already generous last time, but uh, <clears throat> when's the next one coming? When's that, next, when, when's that next offering going to be received? Instead, he seeks to explain his relationship to circumstances and to things. Verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. Honestly, does that word sound positive or negative to you? If you told me somebody was content, would that sound positive or negative? For most of us, it's, it's almost a negative. Content. No, you don't want to be content. You want to try a little harder. You want to do a little bit more. You want to get along a little further. Don't be content. Don't be content in your job. Don't be content in what you have. Don't be content in the circumstances of your life. Push on. Strive harder. Pursue excellence. That's the name of the game. And Paul says, I've learned to be content. Content. That word was the primary word used by Stoics. It meant self-sufficiency. To be self-sufficient. The Stoic was all about learning how to be indifferent, to be indifferent toward the circumstances of his life. Indifferent about circumstances so that nothing could faze them, nothing could hurt them. Oh, I want you to know I wrecked my car. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just a car. I want you to know my house burned down last night. Oh, oh, no big deal. It's just a house. I want you to know my family's all gone. They deserted me. Oh, tragic. Tragic. Oh, no. Now, that's the stoic. The stoic. Untouchable, indifferent, detached, withdrawn. And it all comes out of their own sense of strength, their own sense of, of self-sufficiency. Paul uses that same word. But he redefines it. He uses it very differently. For Paul, he can say, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content because of what I've experienced in my life. Remember chapter 3, verse 10? 
I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death so as to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says this new life in Christ, this vision of who he is, this purpose to which he has called me, this opportunity to be part of his kingdom, so captivates me, so energizes me, that I've learned to be content with my circumstances. Those things don't really matter a lot. Yeah, I've been down and out, and I've had plenty. I've been hungry. I've been full. And I've learned that in any of those situations, Christ is sufficient. His presence, his power, his purpose in my life gives me hope and meaning and joy in all that I do. That's not a fatalism. Hear me. That's not an acquiescence which cuts the nerve of ambition or, or smothers healthy endeavor. Paul's not talking about that. Rather, what he's talking about is a detachment from anxious concern. A detachment from anxious concern concern. Paul says, I'm not worried about it. I don't churn over all of the details of life. I give myself fully to my purpose, to my calling, to the Christ who is my Lord. And therefore, I find peace and joy. I know what it is, Paul says, to be in need. I know what it is to have an abundance. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be full. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have much. In all these things, in fact, in every circumstance, I can do everything Christ calls me to do through his strength, through his strength. I was talking to a young man in his 20s recently. He has a good job. He just has bought a house recently. He's learning to be a homeowner. And mow the yard and all those good kinds of things. Seems to be managing well, enjoying life. I said, man, you know, things seem to, to be going well for you. Do you find yourself very contented or sometimes do you find yourself discontented? I was, I was impressed with his answer. He said, oh yes, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm good, but I'm often discontented. And because of that, I've gotten off of Facebook. Whoa. Explain that to me. Explain that to me. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just that I used to be on Facebook a lot, and I'd see one of my buddies on Facebook. And he'd post that he'd started a new business, and it was going well. And I would say, well, I should be doing that. I could start a business. This old job just didn't much anyway. Or you'd see another buddy that got a promotion or moved to a new place and got a new job. And he'd say, you know, I ought to be making more money. I'm as sharp as he is. Or you'd see a picture of a buddy that was on vacation, took a big trip, or a friend that had gotten engaged standing with his, with his gal. And he said over and over and over again, I would find myself reacting and being suddenly discontented. While I was happy in my job, happy in my relationships, happy in what I was doing, all of these posters, postings suddenly made me discontented. So I backed off. I backed off from Facebook. I was impressed with his insight. I was oppressed with his response. He said, we're just so aware of each other's lives. So aware of what's going on with each other. Kind of. Kind of. You see, I see my buddy who started a new business, and I'm, I'm discontented, but then I don't know that he may be working 70 or 80 hours a week. I see my friend who took that big vacation, but I don't know, he may be in debt up to his ears to pay for it. I see my friend who's in that relationship, but I don't know what that relationship looks like, how happy he is. But somehow, all of those postings can create within me 
a spirit of discontent. I read an article in uh, Time magazine called The Happiness of Pursuit. The Happiness of Pursuit that suddenly verified exactly what my friend was saying. If you're on Facebook, there are more than 1.1 billion other people who can mainline their good times, their new car, their big house, their vacation, that you have to save 10 years to take straight into your brain. Half a billion people on Twitter can do the same. A Time poll said that 60% of respondents said that they do not feel better about themselves after spending time on social media. 76% believe that people make themselves look happier, more attractive, and more successful than they actually are on the Facebook page. What's that mean? What's that saying? That once again, through another development that can be very beneficial and useful. Satan can use that as a tool to create discontentment in my life, to cause me to churn over the circumstances that I face, to long and to envy, be covetous of somebody else's situation, and lose my joy and lose my peace because of that. There was some research done, a massive study of 806,000 people from 135 countries collected over six years. They found that there is a correlation between what we have and our happiness, what we possess and our sense of well-being. But only, only if a person's wealth and aspirations keep pace. Their wealth and aspirations keep pace. Put this together. If you're in the top 5% of the income in America, if you make $170,000, most of you don't have to worry about this, $170,000, but your aspiration is to be in the top 1%, your $170,000 a year won't make you happy. Won't make you feel contented. Paul is teaching us what the Spirit of God wants us to understand is that when our aspirations, when our desires, when our longings are out of bounds, extreme, then something happens to our spiritual well-being. Paul says, I've learned, I've learned to have plenty. I've learned to enjoy abundance. I've learned to be blessed, but I can just as well be hungry be in difficult circumstances. I've learned in all things, in all things, I can be contented in Christ who gives me strength, who gives me strength. Remember the old song, Count Your Blessings? Sarah Benford's favorite song. Some of you remember Sarah? When you are discouraged, well, let's see, how does it start? When you look at others with their land and gold. Think that God has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven nor your home on high. Perspective. Perspective. Do I count blessings? Or do I envy things that other people possess? Or do I envy the things from the up and elite that I see a media today and find myself churning the circumstances, the issues of my life. Maybe the issue for many of us is how to live with plenty. How to live with plenty. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes, young Timothy, and he shares with him a word that were to be addressed with the, to those who were doing well. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. He writes to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, 
which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Have you heard that? God provides us good things in life for our enjoyment. But those good things must never be the source of our security, never the source of our worship or our hope, because they are so uncertain. Like that family that I heard about this week, who bought that $700,000 house, they quickly went to $350,000. Yeah, so uncertain. Instead, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take It's not evil to be well-to-do. But do not make those things the source of your encouragement, the source of your life, the source of your hope. Hold them loosely. Give generously. Don't hoard them. Don't hoard them. Don't spend frivolously. Use them as God sees fit. Paul says, I know what it is to have nothing. I know what it is to have an abundance. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be well fed. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I'm talking with Joanna last week when we spent some time with her, we were reminiscing a little bit about her grandfather, Daddy D, Daddy Dixon. Some of you met her, Kathy's dad, and you knew him. Special, special man in my life and quite a mentor. One of the memories Joanna shared was, though, some of the things that he ate. Sometimes when we visited him, he would pull out of the fridge and put together some of the craziest concoctions of food. I mean, there would be a little bit of this dinner that a neighbor brought him. There'd be a little bit of this dish that he made. There'd be a little bit of this takeout box from a time he'd eaten out. And he'd put all those things together, and my daughter would roll her eyes and say, oh my goodness. But he was content. He was happy with that. And he was also happy when we went out to Uncle Bud's and he'd eat enough catfish to fill Green River. I mean, he could eat me under the table any day. I'm content when I go to Uncle Bud's and I get good fried catfish. But if it's leftovers out of the fridge today, that's okay too. Ernest loved people. He loved his family. When Brownie died and he was now living alone, it was hard. He always looked forward to us coming and being with him, spending time. He looked forward to being with his church family. He looked forward to being with friends. But there were times when he was alone and lonely. He got interested in genealogy. He made the comment one day, my books are my friends. And he'd look at those old, <laughs> boring genealogy books and look at who was whose grandfather, who married whom, when, and moved where. And I'd think, oh my goodness. But he learned to be content. Content when his house was full with all, all of his family and his grandkids, and content when he was sitting alone with his books. Ernest, like all of us, slowed down when he got older. But until just a few weeks before he died, Ernest picked up surplus food at Kroger and took to the rescue mission. He visited other shut-ins who couldn't get out. He continued to serve his Lord in whatever ways he could. He learned to be content Learn to be content in any and every situation. That's what Paul's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go out and jump off this building and fly and not be hurt. Better not try it. I can face any danger and disregard warnings and concerns. Better not try it. 
God calls you to do something, if God gives you a passion, if there are opportunities of ministry and service, if there's a relationship you need to deal with, whatever God calls and challenges you to do, whatever opportunity he's given you, whatever new responsibility is yours, seize it. But seize it not in some stoic idea that I can do it because of who I am, my background, my education, my strength. Do it with that sense that I can face any circumstance, any situation, in the power and the presence of Christ who gives me strength, who gives me strength. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what your life looks like. Some of you are obviously well-fed and content. Some of you may be struggling to buy food. Some of you may be joy, enjoying prosperity and financial security. Some of you may be wondering how to pay the rent next month. Whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance of your life, dare hear this promise. Dare declare with Paul, I don't know how I'm going to face it. I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. I don't know the source from which I will receive help. Nothing about this situation is clear to me right now. But God will provide some way, somehow, in his time and in his purpose, all that I need for all of life. Hey, Paul wasn't blowing smoke. He knew hard times. He knew difficulties. But Paul said, I've also learned that when I'm the weakest, when I'm the weakest, I most experience God's power. I don't know what you're facing, but I know who wants to face it with you. I don't know what you're confronting today, but I know who wants to walk with you today. The good news is the sovereign God of the universe, the creator of all, wants to be your Lord and your God. He wants to provide his sufficiency in your life in all things. Right now, the water may be over your head, and you find, may find nothing, nothing to hold you afloat. But often that's just when God can respond. When we open ourselves to him, declare our dependence and our need for him, and then learn the blessed truth of Paul when he said, I can do all things. All things. Face any situation, any hardship, any circumstance, even abundance. I can deal with that through Christ. He gives me strength. Just now, would you open your heart to God's word to you today? Maybe you need to share how you're responding to the situations of your life right now. Maybe you need to ask for his help, his presence. Maybe you need to seek his reassurance that in what you face, he's not left you alone. He is there with you. Would you dare to speak to him? Speak to him in the quietness of this moment. Thank him for his love, his presence, his sufficiency. You know our hearts and our lives. You know the reality behind our Sunday morning smiles, our glib doing fine. Thank you. Thank you that we can trust you to be sufficient. I pray your word burn deeply into our hearts and our minds today. 
And as we leave this place of worship, we will do so with a stronger resolve to trust you, to lean heavily upon you, to find peace and joy as we discover the contentment you want to give us. We offer you our our lives, even as we offer you thanksgiving and praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, who alone is Lord. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms, our hymn of commitment. We invite you to respond to God's word, to your heart today, to this week. Come and unite with us if you need a church family to encourage you and to strengthen you. Come and receive Christ as your Lord today if you've never made that commitment to him. Accepting that gift of salvation, of eternal life that he wants you to have. Come and kneel and pray. Simply offer him that burden, that hurt in your life. Come and say, Lord, I need to be like Paul. I need to learn contentment. I don't know what it's going to take to teach me. But I offer you my life. Help me to learn to be content. We stand together as we sing. thinking about people who asked to take up an offering, Willie Bourne came to my mind. Willie was faithful in prayer meeting, and most of the time that I shared a need in prayer meeting, Willie, either at that moment or as soon as we dismissed, said, well, come on, guys, let's take care of this. And he'd take up an offering, and we'd meet that need. Special memory of a very special man. Michael and I were joking a little bit uh, this, after, this morning before the message. I'm preaching on contentment, and tonight we're going to talk about remodeling the sanctuary. I don't know how that fits, but about 13 years ago, this church made a decision. We were needing to do some painting, some new carpet in the sanctuary, and we decided to defer all of that until we built a new building, an addition to our building. Well, 13 years later, we're getting back to that. It's been that long. Tonight, we're going to meet here in the sanctuary. We're going to hear a report from our property and space team and let them share some really exciting opportunities for you to struggle, to look, to 
here tonight we're not going to ask you to make any decisions because it's a big decision we just want you to have some of the information that this team has gathered over several months work so i trust you'll be here it's an important decision for the family i'm not sure it's a matter of being discontented i think it's a matter of being responsible to use this tool that the lord has given us this tool and keep it respectable to keep it attractive as we seek to use this tool to reach other people and to be a place of worship and honoring our Lord together. So you come tonight, 6 o'clock, we'll meet here in the, in, the, in the sanctuary and hear their report, hear their recommendation, talk hear the, from the finance team, the sound team, put all of that together, and then allow you some time over the next few days to digest that information and to share it with others. It's great to have the Musons here today. It's always good to have them sneak in and visit with us. Uh, as well as Denise, we're glad that you all can be here and share with us in the service today. I hope some folks will have a chance to speak to you. You can linger a few minutes after the service. Any other announcement, any other word? You heard John pray for Sarah England. She's on her way to Africa today as part of her summer missions trip. Pray for her. She travels for that jet lag that'll hit and then that good experience that she'll have. We've had several students on mission. Next Sunday morning, we'll be commissioning all of our students who are going to the m Fuge, Mission Fuge in Philadelphia. And we look forward to that and for their, their week that's ahead. Another word, Michael? Adam, would you like to introduce the Tanners and share your word too? Good. All right, well, just a couple of things that were not um, in the bulletin this morning. I wasn't around the last couple of days of the week, so I couldn't hunt this down. But so if you got your pens, this may be the most important information that it's not that important. Um, it's uh, there was actually some of you reaching for pens. Uh, tonight we do have The Verge, which is our student worship gathering. Uh, so that was left off the bulletin. So note that we'll be uh, meeting about five o'clock. We'll play the game of Ultimate Frisbee, and then we'll do dinner, and then worship, and then a drive-in movie afterwards. So uh, e even if you're not a student, and you want to come to a drive-in movie, come on, it's going to be right here. So uh, that is tonight. Make sure you mark calendars. Also for our girls and guys small groups, that's not on there. Uh, there is no girls small group th this week, but there is a guys small group at the Caddis' home. So uh, please note that. There's also some, uh, some, some other opportunities like prayer meeting. Uh, make sure you follow up on that as well. Well, uh, this is uh, kind of a coincidence since this is Vacation Bible School Week. I, I did want to do one thing. I want to say thank you so much to our VBS director, Ms. Mina Gastineau. Is Mina here this morning? Yes? Hey, Mina, if you would stand up for me, please. This is Mina. Everybody say thank you so much to Mina. She worked... Um, she worked incredibly hard, making it just one of the most fantastic weeks around here. Uh, she lost, uh, the girls won on collecting school supplies, so you said she dyed her hair hot pink, but I see nothing but black and brown over there. So if I wore a wedding dress last year to church, we might be redoing your hair. So anyway, I'm so grateful for Mina. Make sure you say a word to her um, as you get an opportunity. Speaking of that, um, for the last, uh, I guess two or three years ago, uh, the Tanners, come on up, uh, started coming to Vacation Bible School. Uh, they were a part of a different church and just uh, uh, came here, and uh, then they started to visit with us, what, over a year ago. Uh, and so this morning they have come to join our family. Isn't that exciting? Yes, church? That's exciting. Uh, and, and here's the cool thing. They're already a part of our family. This is uh, Laura Tanner and Jeff Tanner and their children, and, uh, and so they've already been serving with us. They served at Bible school. They serve up at The Zone, which is our children's ministry, and so we're so excited for them, and we're excited for you guys to come and join. We know uh, that this is not a perfect church. There isn't a perfect church, you know, but we're a church um, who's seeking uh, everything that God wants for our life, and so we're excited that, that you guys are here. Do you have a word to share or anything? Are you sure? Glad to be here. It's good times on the mic, by the way. So uh, we're grateful for them. If you um, commit to loving them and praying for them and accepting them into our fellowship, would you indicate that by raising your right hand as we quote our text together? But we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We're excited for you guys. We're excited for what the future holds and pursuing God together and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, who would like to come stand? Uh, the uh, Tanners, if you get a moment, if you wouldn't mind uh, sliding by and greeting them as you head out. 
uh, and we're just excited. John, do you have anything else for us this morning? One thing, real quick. Real quick, yep. Is Jake Crabtree here? Jake. Jake is our student intern this summer. Oh yeah. And Jake. Jake also has just worked tirelessly the last two or three weeks. I am so grateful for that and looking forward to what he will do the rest of the summer. Jake, stand up. You're hard to see. <laughs> Welcome, Jake. All right, folks. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. We know you could be so many places. So I'll pray for us, and then we'll stand and sing our uh, ending song again. When you get a chance, stop by and see the Tanners this morning. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're, we are grateful that you love us more. God, we're grateful that uh, you thought about, about us before we were even born. And so, God, we pray that we would learn to find contentment even in that. That, Father, if we have nothing, God, we have you, and that is enough for us. God, I thank you for the Tanners and, God, for them joining our family. We uh, pray they would be blessed. God, we pray that they would be a blessing as well. God, we thank you for this church. God, these people that have gathered together to seek you. We pray that you would continually mold us into the kind of people that you're calling us to be. So, Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you.